You have heard the law that says, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. In that way, you will be acting as true children of your Father in heaven. For he gives his sunlight to both the evil and the good. He sends rain on the just and the unjust alike. If you love only those who love you, what reward is there for that? Even corrupt tax collectors do that much. If you are kind only to your friends, how are you different from anyone else? Even pagans do that. But you are to be perfect in love even as your Father in heaven is perfect in love. Friends, welcome back to the Wild at Heart podcast here in the week of March 14th. John and Alan and Alex in the studio this week. Hey, guys. Hey, John. (laughs) Hey, hey. We are following a week of some pretty high-octane feedback (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> into the organization here around our Praying for the War in Eastern Europe podcast that we did last week. And I think I want to just begin by saying, you know what? We're human. We're fallible. We don't get everything right. We yeah. don't. We don't get everything right. We maybe don't pray right. We don't say the right things. We're not inclusive enough. I get that. Yep. Yes. But I just found myself wondering whatever happened to the benefit of the doubt Hmm. in the world Hmm. today? Like, well, like, wow, that sure feels like a vanishing quantity. Yeah, it does. Yeah. The benefit of the doubt. So rather than jumping into, this is not a follow-up podcast to the war in Eastern Europe, because there are other things going on in the world that we are equally as Mm -hmm. empathetic about, brokenhearted about, Yemen, Ethiopia, I mean, on and on and on it goes, elections that are going on, all kinds of things. It got me thinking, what does it look like? How do we operate as a mature follower of Jesus in an hour like this, in in, in times like this? And so that piece about love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you, how's that going, fellas? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> wow. Uh, not awesome? I, man, I don't know that I thought a lot about it. Exactly. Right? Yes. Me too. Kind of just get a little swept up in things that are happening around you and and forget that whole piece. Yeah. A little bit. Yeah. Yeah, I was hoping Alex would say more so I didn't have to say anything, <laughs> but uh, it's immensely hard. It's rare that I can genuinely pray for my enemies. I find I'm a much better prayer warrior when I'm praying for something and sometimes against something. But uh, when it comes to trying to love people that are radically different or actively hostile, it's, it feels like mission impossible a lot of times. Yeah. I don't want to do it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I read a startling thought years ago that has haunted me, and I wish I could credit who said this, but they said, if you're not growing in love, you're dying as a mm. soul. Your mm. soul is dying. And I'm like, no, that's not true. <laughs> I don't want that to be true. There are all, all kinds of other things. I, I'm, I'm growing in my ability to, you know, be a good dad, or I'm growing in my ability to, you know, lead an organization. But this whole idea of growing in maturity, in love, in a high octane moment like this, I, I think that's worth thinking about. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't have a problem with the idea that growing in love is a sign of maturity. I I guess I just don't very often think about it in relation to my enemies. Yeah. And so I, I look at it in the ways that I love people that are easy to love, but I, I don't, I don't necessarily evaluate it very often from the standpoint of how, how am I loving the people that are hard in my life that aren't easy to love? Yeah. 
but God, this is a tough one. I, doesn't it? God yeah. puts into every person's life, yeah, people, yeah, right, right, who are difficult to love, yeah, people with very strong opinions that are very different than yours, or lifestyles, or values, right? I mean, this is I'm describing families, yeah, right, that yeah, everybody finds themselves facing this, whether it's global or immensely personal. Mm -hmm. I want to back up to COVID for a minute because the, the COVID-19 pandemic and it's, and the policies around it, vaccines, masks, quarantines, you know, the different mandates, social distancing, et cetera. You can meet in person, you can't, size of me, all that that we have gone through. There's just been nothing in our hour, in our era, that has split mm. people like that has. Mm -hmm. I mean, honestly, more than more than abortion, more than sexual issues, like like COVID split churches. Yeah, right. And they're not back together, <laughs> by the way. Uh, yeah. Yeah, they, they haven't like reconciled. COVID policies split families. Yeah. And what I just want to wonder about is like, what is it? What is it with us that we would say, you know what? I would rather destroy this church than yield my position on masks. I would rather destroy my family relationships than yield my position on vaccines and all that it stands mm -hmm. for, you mm -hmm. know, being in the right and being on the right side of things and like, whoa. Yeah. What is it with people? Well, I think we've lived in a culture where everybody has their very strong opinion on everything, fueled, I believe, by a lot of social media where you surround yourself with voices that are in absolute agreement and that accelerates your own sense of, I am right. This is the way. There is no other option. Everybody's got their view, but there's a million people who all believe they have the way. And, and sometimes it's not one of two ways, it's one of 50 ways and, and there's not even agreement. So then that plays out like in a church or in a family setting where there's no tolerance for anything but agreement. And when that doesn't happen, the opinion is so strong. Yeah, they're willing to forego mm -hmm. a relationship or, or break off a bond that you thought was kind of a, an unbreakable bond mm -hmm. for something that feels very temporal and, and in a sense, not, not at all the biggest thing. But I've seen that in my own family. I've seen that in the yeah. church that I was a part of, and um, it's frightening to see. Mm, yeah. yeah, it feels very unprecedented. Mm. I, I think the time we're living in feels so unprecedented. Earlier in my life, 20, 30 years ago, yeah, we had divisions of people and disagreements on sides of issues and thoughts and different things, but it feels so unprecedented nowadays because it's it's in communities that you would have thought, yeah, you know, believes the same way and has the same values and, and there's deep division nowadays. Mm. And I've experienced this through the pandemic where I've had a couple people who I'm close to, who I love and I care about, who literally chose to leave the state they live in, where all their family is, to go to another state where they have the hope that there will be people that believe the way that they believe. Yeah. And that they would find allies there that agree with them. And they're willing to give up being in proximity to family and to people they've been mm. around for the hope that there'll be people who they don't even know. Mm that will just agree with them. Mm. And that's become the highest value in their life mm. is we just want to be around people that see things the way we see it. Yeah. And, and that's, that's what's baffling to me. Yeah. And it, and like you're saying, it is, it's splitting, splitting churches, it's splitting families. 
and I, and I'm seeing it up close and personal in some of these some of these relationships I have and I see it in me. Yeah. That's the thing mm. that I ooh, like I see it in me. Yeah. That those who those who don't see things the way I do <laughs> Clearly wrong, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right? I mean, obviously, they're getting the wrong news. They're they're yeah. in the wrong social media. They, you know, yeah. they yeah. they've been hoodwinked by somebody or something. They're just not willing to look at the facts. Like it's embarrassing yeah. that my fundamental operating position is I'm right, and you are clearly misinformed uh-huh. or just stubborn. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. <laughs> With everything ratcheting up, right? Like we're running on empty. Everything's ratcheting up around us. The world is heating up. We go from one issue, global issue, to the next global issue. And guys, for me, I see then, it's not necessarily I'm getting in arguments with people about what's happening internationally or even about masks sometimes, but I just find myself ready to be right about whatever's in front of me. Yes. Mm-hmm. And so like yesterday, teacher to one of our students sends an email out about a parent teacher conference that he categorized as something uh, one of our kids didn't do right in class. But he copied every teacher of every one of that child's classes. And so not only did something feel unfair and untrue, but now every teacher is given this perspective. Well, I immediately jump on the email and I'm like, hey man, first of all, I don't think this is an accurate representation. Second, you just copied people that has nothing to do with that class. I'm talking to my wife and she's like, Alan, he emailed you back and said he was sorry it was a mistake. She was challenging me in a good way to go, What? why can't you assume in love that it was just a simple mistake and Hmm. everything's good. But I think the reason is because I'm so wound up from everything Mm. that Mm. love, it's very hard to find love in those situations and much easier to have the, I'm right. And Mm. this needs to be set right. Mm. And it's not a loving stance at all. It, you know, it's, it's almost like a strength gone bad. And I think that's happening in our world a lot right now on little and big divisive issues. Mm. That idea of I'm so wound up or angry or strung out or stressed out or I'm so tired of being told that I'm wrong and I've got to put my mask back on or I've got, you know, Mm -hmm. I've got to take a bite of my sandwich and then put my mask back on on this flight. I can take a sip of water and put my mask, you know, I'm, I'm, whatever it is, people are so done. They're so at the extreme edge of their character <laughs> <laughs> that then it's just, I'm going to win this one. I am going to win this email, this debate, this family issue. You know, we're not coming for Thanksgiving this year. We're taking a stand. I, like, yeah. Yeah. I think I would probably bring a little different perspective to some of that too, because I I appreciate Alan. You don't shy away from a good debate or a good confrontation. And I'm also aware myself, I'm a bit more of a people pleaser, right? And I'm highly empathetic. Mm. And it was interesting. I was having a conversation with a friend. She's a she's a counselor, former therapist. Now she's stay-at-home mom, but in the middle of the pandemic, we were having a conversation about how hard it had been, and what we identified was it's actually a really difficult time for people who are people-pleasers and highly empathetic because it's a a lose-lose. You know, for me, I haven't known what I'm going to encounter out there, and so is this store going to be a store that if I if they've lifted the mask mandate, but this store hasn't changed their stance and I walk in without a mask, someone's gonna be offended. And so I'm on constant high alert yes. of how do I navigate all the people around me so that I mm. can be okay and they can be okay. Mm. And and so I I maybe come at it from a little different yeah. perspective of, you know, how am I gonna hold on to my rights? 
and I'm more worried about how are people around me reacting. And, and it's not out of love because I'm not asking the question, what, you know, what does love look like in this situation? I'm asking the question, how do I be okay? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But it's stressful. Yeah. And when you live at a level of stress for months and months and years and years, right. it is depleting. Yeah. And some people have been going, yeah, we're really tracking with you through these podcast series. We need oil. We need more of God in our lives. We need, I think other people are going, really? I'm, I'm good. I, and I want to say until somebody steps on your toe. Yeah. <laughs> until somebody challenges something important to you and then that depletedness and there's just a ramp, you know, yeah. or, or the retreat or the ghost silent or, yeah. mm -hmm. I'm going to, I'm going to actually diverge the conversation for a moment to something that I think will be really helpful for our listeners to know. So there was a very important breakthrough in like human history and in the study of sociology and cultures and like what makes human culture work and what congeals human culture and kind of brings people together and provides a sense of community and esprit de corps and what breaks it down. Hmm. And it came through who has become now a well-known French sociologist, René Girard, in the 70s. He published a book called Things Hidden from the Foundation of the World. He's, he's operating from a believing standpoint in Christ. And then uh, another guy, Gil Bailey, in his book, Violence Unveiled, sort of explained Girard <laughs> to the world mm -hmm. and applied it to a number of situations. But I thought it was really interesting. I was re-looking at, at Bailey uh, this morning in... He was saying it's, a, it's especially important that we recognize the link between social and psychological instability. The subjective experience of psychological insubstantiality in the myriads of ways of compensating for it is a growing problem, especially among the young. People are rattled. People don't feel secure. People don't feel like they've got a solid foundation. They don't, people don't feel safe. Mm -hmm in family systems or in churches or in their communities. He's, say, he's saying, why is that? What, what's going on there? And then he backs up to Girard. Girard's basic thesis is this, that human history is the relentless chronicle of violence that it is, and the violence that we're seeing in the world today, not just in Eastern Europe, but in many, many places, because... When cultures fall apart, they fall into violence. And when they revive themselves, they do so violently. And what they do, the, the, big, the big insight was what he called the scapegoating mechanism. It, it's that we will find a scapegoat for all of this pent-up rage and frustration and demand and offense and all that. We're going to find a scapegoat. Hmm. And, and then we're gonna we're gonna rebuild unity by hating something together. Wow. <laughs> okay. Hmm. So like, what's really creepy about this is family systems will do this. Like, you'll have the black sheep, hmm. and everybody in the family can like get in the kitchen and feel a sense of camaraderie because we're talking about, you know, so and so and their drinking or so and so and their you know, relationships or their failed marriage yeah. or whatever, right? And we mm -hmm. all feel, we feel together yeah, because we've found a scapegoat. Mm. Wow. Right? It's super sobering because what Gerard's thing is, he goes back and starts looking through all these culturals and these cultural rituals that still remain in the world. And he's going, look, folks, like this is how the cultures of the world brought stability back into a community was they'd find a scapegoat and then everybody's fine with it. Everybody's fine with, well, you know, those are the bad guys. And so we'll kill them or we'll persecute them or we'll enslave them or whatever, you know, we'll blacklist them. They'll be out and we'll be in. Mm. And you think about the, how that's operated around the pandemic, right? Right. Whew. Yeah. One of the things that Girard's insight gave us was, wait a second, is this really cultural unity or are we just scapegoating 
and we're Hmm. experiencing a false sense Hmm. of esprit de corps because we've all found a common bad guy. Yeah. Right? You can follow this down through human history. It's, It's pretty creepy. But here's what Bailey says. He says, societies all over the world are growing more socially volatile and the psychological stability of those living in them is declining. And the reason is this scapegoating mechanism isn't working anymore. Hmm. And it isn't working anymore because of the introduction of the gospel. And this is the fascinating thing. This was one of Gerard's kind of big things is that Christ enters the scene and he is the ultimate scapegoat right. in the sense of, you know, Caiaphas says to the other guys, they get together and they go, look, man, like, hey, hey, I mean, this guy may be innocent, but we got to kill him hmm. or the Romans are going to come in here and make things worse, yeah. right? Yeah. And, and Caiaphas literally says, it's better for one innocent person to die than the whole nation to perish. And so that's it. Like mm. that's the fundamental, you know, kind of cultural thing down through history. And so they kill Christ. And what's fascinating is the moment of the Roman soldier. He is the representative. He is the guy to carry out this system. He's standing there at the foot of the cross right yes jesus dies and he goes oops surely this was the son of god Mm. it's like we just killed an innocent man and he happened to be the son of god like like it is the beginning of the unraveling of the system Mm. and then like when the book of hebrews says let us go outside the gate yeah and bear his reproach because christ is killed you know outside the city he is scapegoated, but then Christianity says, no, like he, he has come to unite us around a new congealing force, which is love yeah, and forgiveness, yeah, right? And mutual respect and understanding, right? He introduces a whole new ethos into the world. I bring that up because in a time where we are rattled, we are not at our best, it is really easy to fall back into that scapegoating mechanism. It's easy to fall back into tribalism and, you know, it's those guys and we're going to, you know, it's mm-hmm. the unvaccinated. That's who it is. Like, get them, mm-hmm. you know, or, or, or whatever. Yeah. Right. Right. And Christianity steps in and introduces this crazy thing of you, you actually need to love your enemies and you need to pray for. I literally want you to pray for the people you dislike yeah, and the people you disagree with. Mm. Man, John, I'm just moved as, as I think about Christ and, and those final hours, final days as the ultimate scapegoat and, and his ultimate act with his disciples was at the dinner where he washes their feet. And I, and I think we forget he washed, he washed Judas's feet. Mm. He took on. Yeah, I didn't even think of that. The place of a servant and washed the feet of the man that would betray him. Yeah. And, and just gave us all the ultimate example of love. Yeah. It's profound. Jesus warns us as we as we enter the phase of human history called the end of the age, and and we're there, gang, he says, don't let anyone mislead you, for many will come in my name claiming I am the Messiah. They will deceive many, and you will hear of wars and threats of wars, but don't panic. Yes, these things must take place, but the end won't follow immediately. Nation will go to war against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in many parts of the world. But all this is only the first of the birth pains. With more to come, you will be arrested, persecuted, killed. You will be hated all over the world because you are my followers. And many will turn away from me and betray and hate each other. And many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. Sin will be rampant everywhere. And the love of many will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. 
And what I had never connected was those two sentences at the end of the paragraph there, right? The love of many will grow cold, but those who endure to the end will be saved. Those who do not grow cold in love, those who mm. don't abandon mm. the way of love and fall back into the human inclination to go to tribalism and us versus them and hatred. And and I, I'm not saying things like global politics are not important. I'm not saying that difficult decisions are not important. I'm not saying that policies are not important for, you know, handling pandemics. I'm not saying that. But what is in our hearts? What is in our hearts? And, and how do we handle the people that disagree with us? Mm. And I'm remembering a famous story about Tony Campolo. Uh, this is out of the 70s, evangelicalism, Campolo. At, at that time in the 70s, there, the big African famines were going on. Mm -hmm. And Campolo is in a church, in the pulpit, and he says, I forget what the figure of millions is, so I'll just say, you know, millions of children are dying around the world of famine, of starvation, and most of you don't give a shit. <laughs> Pause for effect, gasps in the church, and he goes on to say, and you know what's worse? You are more upset right now that I use the word shit than that millions of children are dying of starvation. Yeah, I remember <laughs> <Yeah>. that. <laughs> I love Tony Campolo. It's, yeah. A, it, yeah. it's a bust on human nature. We get our little positions. We get the little things that we will, you know, go to the stake on. We will die on this sword. And he's like, really, people? Really? You're going to blow up your family over masks? Really? Yeah. You're going to sabotage the church of Jesus Christ? over vaccines, because in 10 years, that is going to be history. Mm. But the church still has a role in the world, you know? Yeah. One is eternal and one is not, and you're willing to blow up the eternal over something that is passing? Mm. So I, I love that story. story. And it, it, it busts me because I'll go back, swing a little bit back towards last week's podcast. So many of our listeners might not know that my previous career was in politics mm. and social policy. Mm. I worked in Washington, D.C., went to White House lunches, interviewed the top people in government, wrote articles, speeches, sat in on Supreme Court hearings. And God rescued me from that world. Mm. For the, I'm looking back on it now. There were a number of reasons. It, it wasn't my calling. What I do now is my calling. You know, I, yeah. I, was, I was just filling out someone else's dreams for my life, to be honest. But I can see the rescue now for me because in that era in my life, I was convinced that it is far more important to be on the right side of an issue than it is to be loving. Mm. I would have even told you that as a follower of Christ. Wow. I'm like, no, 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 no. You don't understand. This stuff is important. Like, this is really important, and it is. I'm not diminishing the importance of these things. But I would have gone so far as to say, you know, um, love is weak. You really have mm. to take a stand, people. Come on, mm. get on the right side of things. And, yeah. I, and I would have said, it's more important to win the argument and show people how messed up their thinking is on X, Y, and Z, you know, than it is for me to love them. Wow. I'm just embarrassed to admit that, but I was just driven by that. You know, what Campolo was trying to show was I was just so driven by hanging on to my position. Mm. on things right? and not really thinking through, you know what, you can win the argument and lose the soul. Yeah. You can lose that person for Jesus Christ by how you handle them. Mm. But it's so easy to find that micro issue that is the hill to die on. And I don't know if a lot of listeners know this, but I'm the one who will call people back and get emails from 
if a curse word is said in this podcast right here because of that story <laughs> you just said, we're going to get people who are hyper offended or upset or disappointed that there was a curse word in the podcast and they won't tend to hear anything that was said because of that, because that just kind of just unhinged that ability to, to go further. And I say that because I have my own things that do the same thing in my life, but what you're naming, John, anything other than love allows that possibility. Like if I put anything as my hill to die on other than the power of God's love, then offense can get in, rage, right, wrong, justice, judgment. And here in my 50s, I'm learning most of my life was spent in those waters. And it's not, I saw it as a strength, but now I see love as a strength. And that's changing, starting to change who I am. But it's a, you know, it's hard because it's it's much easier to go out guns blazing on whatever the topic is. Hmm. Yeah, John, I don't, um, I don't know if you remember back in the day, but you know, you and I worked for same place before all of this existed. Wild at Heart, Ransom Heart came to be, and you know, I came to work here at at the time, Ransom Heart, now Wild at Heart, uh, back in two thousand eight, and. I remember as I was trying to make the decision, God, is this where you want me? Is this where you're leading me to this place? And and this just points to the rescue God did in you, John. You're describing your DC days, but there was a massive transition in, in your life. And so I'm I'm trying to make the decision and you you had left that organization eight ish years previously. And after leaving there, they came to you and they had some concerns about some of your ideas and your writings and they wanted you to change it. And they weren't happy with stances you had and, and thoughts you had. I won't go into great detail there, but you know, they basically made a mandate. You change it or else we're going to pull everything we carry of yours out of our organization. And there was a lot of, a lot of reason to stay with that because, you know, big platform and yeah, big opportunity to sell more books. And, and, um, and there's also a lot of reason for you to get offended by that. And I remember, so this had all happened previous to, me looking at a position here at Wild the Heart. And one of the people that was involved in that came to me out of, out of concern. And here I am, I'm asking God, God, is this where you have me to go? Mm. And that person described that scenario and what happened and they described you and they said, um, they, were, they were so blown away by your willingness to come in and hear them out, to not get offended, to then take what they had presented and go to God and ask God, God, do you want me to change these things? And then when God said, no, John, I don't, your willingness to go back to them and say, hey guys, I'm sorry, God has not led me to change what you would like me to change and, and, but I still bless you and you're welcome to remove my stuff. And that doesn't, you know, doesn't change my heart for you. And I bless you and we'll, we'll part ways. And, um, and I remember that that was the confirmation I needed from God, mm. um, because it was, it was truly loving. You heard people out and they they weren't willing to change their mind and yet you didn't you didn't go to a fence. You didn't go to a place of, well, screw you guys and you know, there there was none of that in you. And 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 that's when I knew that's that's an organization I want to work with. That's love. Mm. 
that that is only the power of Jesus. Right. <laughs> to change, <laughs> to change a crusader, man. I was a crusader, but thank you for that. I didn't know that story. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I, I didn't know that story. Years and years ago, when I first became a Christian, I was um, at Sierra Madre Congregational Church in <laughs> Southern California, a great group of people. And there was a foreign exchange. I don't know if he was like a student or how he had wound up in the U.S., but there was a beautiful African-American man who had been persecuted as a Christian under the regime of Idi Amin in Uganda. And if you look up Idi Amin, I mean, he is considered, quote, one of the most brutal despots in world history. And there is a lot of bloodshed and torture and persecution and imprisonment. And I think if I have the story right, this beautiful man that I met, the Christian man who was arrested, tortured, believed that he was hung upside down for most of his imprisonment. Wow. One night, his tormentor came in to just do the nightly beating. And when he was done, the victim, this Christian man, prayed for him, blessed him. And the guy blew up. And he just said, who are you? How can you do that? What, mm. what are you talking about? How can you possibly do that? Why don't you hate me? Wow. And he tells him about Jesus. And this guard helps him escape. Hmm. And, and he gets out of there with his life and he winds up in, in a church that I went to in Southern California. He told that story, but only because he was asked to. He wasn't like super forward with that. Hmm. I was really blown away by that, going, man, I don't, I don't know that I would do that. I don't know that that's in me, but it's, it stayed with me, obviously. That story hmm. stayed with me these years. What... Is it more important to love or to be right? Is it more important to win the argument or to win the heart for God? Yeah. And, and in an hour like this, Jesus warns us. He says, yes, because of the increase of sin, yeah. because of the evil in the world, it's going to be really hard to hang on to your priorities, mm -hmm. that love always comes first, and to pray for the people that you disagree with. We just wanted to entertain this conversation right now because the mm. world is just such a volatile place. Yeah. And, and in that psychological collapse, in the, in the social collapse, you know, we keep trying to revert to the scapegoating mechanism, but it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. It doesn't bring about genuine unity. Like that family in the kitchen that's gossiping about aunt so-and-so or whatever. Like, yeah, they have a moment of what feels like, you know, camaraderie, but it doesn't last. Right. Yeah. Because it's not built on anything real. It's it's awful. It, mm. You know, the only thing that lasts is the unity of the spirit right? And the bond of love, and the kingdom of God. So just something we're thinking about this week, gang, as, as the world continues to be a violent place. And what does it look like to be a mature follower of Jesus in an hour like this? Strong opinions are important. Strong convictions matter. We're not saying everything is the same. Yeah. We're just saying in our hearts, mm -hmm. how are we going about this? What is propelling us? And watch out, because it's just super easy to fall into hatred yes. and righteous, you know, indignation and judgment and go, whoa, 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 hang on. Yeah. And forget about love. And forget about love. In the end, your life will be evaluated on the quality of your loving, not on the positions you held. Mm. And that's what really shocked me when I was in the thick of it all, in politics and policy and the good guys versus the bad guys. I was really struck by, whoa, wait a second. When, when I stand before my father, yeah. not in condemnation, but just as we look through my life, my life is going to be evaluated first, 
right? On right. the on the quality of my loving, hmm. not that I held the right positions, but lacked love, right? Yeah. It's huge.